Hello, my name is Kevin Tomey. I'm with the Chief Reporter. Behind the camera and producing this episode is Don Thorne. Today, Jamie Farney from Chalet Cheese Cooperative. Jamie, this is the cheese plant that's been around since when? 1948 this was built here. Before that, our other factory is at the bottom of the hill, which is gone now. Um, this was built in conjunction with Kraft, Kraft Cheese, Norm Kraft put up the money for it, and then Chalet bought them out after four or five years. Okay, so you were making cheese for your craft at that time? Yes, yeah, most of all, all the Limburger that was made here went to craft, yes. And if you didn't know, this is the only plant in the United States that's making Limburger cheese. Yeah. So what are we making today? This is Baby Swiss here. We already made the Limburger. That was done at five o'clock this morning. This is all Baby Swiss. We're making eight vats of that today. So, so are they cutting Limburger right now? That's that's the uh, Baby Swiss that are cutting. Oh, that's, they're cutting yeah. Baby Swiss right yeah. now. You want to go take a look? Yeah. So explain the process right now in this. What, what's going on? They have a vertical and horizontal knife. So they'll, they'll go up with, on one side with the vertical one, the other side is the horizontal. They'll turn them, come back, that cuts the curd, and then they'll cut it horizontally across so it cross, so it cross cuts the cheese. Um, that was already done, we didn't see that. But now they're just putting in the agitator to start the way separating from the, the curd. So the curd knives themselves, there's a vertical, and then there's a horizontal? Yes. Are they, they, are they on the same paddle? No. There's two different ones. Um, you can see here. Just, yeah. These are the vertical ones. Okay. These are vertical. And we have another one that's horizontal. So that it cuts it and then we have to cross cut it the other way to make the small curds. Okay. So it's, it's basically like rice. So how long will it agitate then? This will agitate for now for two and a half hours. Two and a half hours. Yeah. And that's for baby Swift. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, and so this one's been cooking longest, and then we've got this one's the longest. Oh, that one's the longest. Yes. And they're 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 an hour apart. This one they're just getting milk into now from the pasteurizer. Okay. It's got cultures in it already. When it's full, they'll take the rennet enzyme and set the vat, and it'll be like a big bowl of jello. Okay. And then they'll cut it with the knives. Yeah. Can we go see the cellars? Sure. So we're not in the cellars yet, but this is a, what, 20 pound block of? It's about 40 pounds of Limburger. 40 pound block of Limburger. This was made at five o'clock this morning. So we don't have the smell yet. No, no, this is probably like the consistency of a feta. From here, what are we gonna do with that? Tomorrow morning, to let, let it sit out here in the, uh, it's about 60 degrees out here, and the whey will drain off. You can see the whey dripping out the end here. Um, tomorrow morning, we'll cut it into squares. We have a pneumatic, cutter over here. Oh, I see. They'll cut that into, into eight ounce pieces and then roll each one in salt and then they'll take it into the Limburger cellar. So we, you're gauging the Limburger in eight ounce blocks? Yes. Rather than a big block? Right. Why is that? Uh, with the Limburger smear, you won't get the Limburger smear into the center of the cheese. Um, also, it's hard for somebody to get a big block of that. We couldn't sell it as a big block. Why can't you cut it after you age it? Because then we wouldn't get the salt in the, into the center. I mean, if we did this, the inside of this would not be. What does the salt do? Salt does three things. It helps form the cheese, helps away drainage, and gives the flavor. Helps away, so it's getting the moisture yep. out, yep. out of the block. Yep. Okay. Well, let's go on to the uh, cellar. So now we're in the, the cellars. And this is an eight ounce cut that we were just talking about. And how old would this be? This is actually five days old. And so the, 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 the odor isn't really strong no, yet? No, that It'll take three months before you get the odor on it. How long will it sit here? In the, in our, in the facility or yeah, in here? In, in, the, in the cellars. That's a week. A week. And then it's wrapped. Yeah. And then where? where was then it? it goes in the cooler for distribution. Okay. I mean, there's some of them that like it month or two old, some of our customers, and some of them like it three, four, or five months old. Shelf life is about six months. Okay. And then it turns uh, ammoniated 
Only the diehard Limburgers leave it at that time. Okay. So, <laughs> so what, what makes Limburger? What happens? It's, what they do here, and I wish the fellow was here, but he, they take the Limburger and they'll hand rub it on the boards here and put it on the shelves and space them out. What happens, the Limburger smear is uh, bacteria and saltwater solutions. It's B. linens is the bacteria. And that's, that's the common bacteria for all surface ripened cheeses. Pretty much all, I shouldn't okay. say all. Um, that breaks down the uh, proteins and the fatty acids in the cheese. That's what gives what it gets soft. But that limburger, that bacteria, keeps building on that cheese, and then it, that's where the smell comes from. Is that bacteria that's rubbed, hand rubbed on there? Now it's hand rubbed twice in here in a seven-day period. I'm sorry, I got background noise. It's, it's, it's hand rubbed twice. Each piece is hand rubbed twice in a seven-day period before it gets wrapped. Seven-day period, a week's yeah. period. Yeah. So you were just talking about how labor intensive it is. Mm -hmm. Can you describe that? What's, what goes on? Um, well, like we just saw out there with a big piece, they, one guy cuts it and two other guys hand roll them in salt, bring them in here, another guy has to put them on the boards, and then this fella here that's doing this is, catches each piece twice in a seven day period, then it's run on the machine, three people, other people touch it, okay. <laughs> and then after that it gets labeled by two other people, hand labeled, um, so I, I think there's a total of 16 times that, a, that a one piece will get handled. Of course, it'll go upside these. Okay. And do it in here, but now talk yeah. about these boards. Are, are these famous boards? Or are they exchanged yearly or what? what these some of these boards have been here since I've been here. Okay. And I've been here forty years. <laughs> they were here before I was here, I should say. We'd like to say they came over to Mayflower, <laughs> <laughs> but um, a lot of these came from the other plant. When when they first started doing this plant making Limburger, they couldn't get the Limburger smear on, it wouldn't work. And they had newer boards. They wouldn't work, wouldn't work, so they brought the boards up from the other plant that they had stored down there, and then it took off. But there's, there's actually bacteria in these boards, in the drains. So it's really important to have yeah, these. Yeah, very important. We have to have a, a variance from the Department of Agriculture, Wisconsin, uh, for, to use wood boards, okay. which everybody does in the state. So. And this is why no one else in the United States is making uh, Limburger cheese. Right, right. Okay. There's, not, there's not the demand that isn't there. We make four to 500,000 pounds a year, and that supplies the whole United States. Okay. Well, let's step outside. The air conditioning went on, and we'll take it, the conversation to another level. We're back here in the Swiss, baby Swiss room. Now, this is a 40-pound block. Tell me about the difference between Swiss and baby Swiss. Swiss typically is, the way they call it baby, it's small. That, that was what it would start it off to be. It's smaller cheese, the baby Swiss, 40 pound block. Um, traditional Swiss is um, part skim. Ours is full fat. We don't standardize milk. We don't put powders in it, nothing. What does what, that mean? Well, they, they put uh, powder in the, in, in with the milk to okay. increase the, um, the protein levels. We don't do any of that. What we get in for milk is what we make. We have 14 farms that are, are pretty high in fat to begin with. I mean, we have 35% of our cows on the farms are, are brown Swiss. So we're, we've got a pretty high fat level. How many brown Swiss cows? 35% of ours. Okay. 65 and they're, and they're higher protein? Or higher, and fat. And higher fat. Yep. And that's important when you make cheese. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's because you get a, more of a, um, more of a uh, yield out of the... The, the cheese if it's higher fat. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we're going to so plug what, it. Yeah, what happens in here, we'll bring this cheese in here after it's packaged. Um, about four days after it's packaged, it's been through the salt stages. We're salting it, hand, hand rubbing. We don't use a brine system. It's all hand dry salted. Um, another labor intensive again. Um, so what happens, we bring them back here into a, a warmer room and it develops the eyes. There's a propionic bacteria that we add to the milk in the making room to develop the eyes. Okay. So, and, and the eyes are, again, smaller than the Swiss yes, eyes. Yeah. And the propionic, I can't even Propionic say bacteria. And that's a, just used as a different culture? Yes. It, it, what it does is produces a, a bacteria in there, and it, when it's warm, it makes a little pocket in there. We don't have elves in there digging it out with. <laughs> and some people think that. <laughs> that well, doesn't happen. It's labor intensive <laughs> yeah, cheese. Yeah. Huh? yeah.
So oh, you can, as you can see, the eyes are very shiny. Nice eye development. That's what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. You want a nice sweet flavor on it. So how long will this age here? This will be in here two to three weeks. Two to three weeks? Yeah. And I come in every morning along with another fella. And we go through the cheese in here to see what stages is that it is at. So, so describe what you're looking for in this cheese now. How old is this one right now, would you say? Um, three weeks. And what do we what do we when we taste it, what are we looking for? A, a mild, very mild, sweeter flavored cheese. Um, the texture of it. Very creamy. Yes. That's why I said when with the traditional Swiss is part skim, so the, some of the fat is taken off of it. Right. So it, it is a drier cheese the regular than, than the baby Swiss is. And how many how much uh, cheese is in here? Oh, there's three weeks worth. And what type of production? You make Limburger, you make Swiss, baby Swiss. You make anything else? Brick. Brick. German brick. That we don't make a lot of brick. We don't compete with the Decaters and the Klondikes. Um, okay. But we make a German brick out of that brick. Which How, is, what's the difference between a German brick and a Limburger then? Brick is a little bit drier, um, lower moisture. Limburger is 50% moisture, whereas um, brick is about 44. So it's a little bit, and it, you can get more shelf life out of a brick because it is lower moisture. Okay. So, so a, a German brick will never turn into a Limburger? It'll start tasting like it. Yeah, they're, they're very similar in taste, but not the brick is not quite as strong as a Limburger. Okay. It, age for age. Once it starts getting up into 10 months, the brick, you're going to notice it tastes like very similar to Limburger, yeah. Okay. And it'll get soft. All right. Well, can we go sit down somewhere and uh, continue sure. the discussion? Sure. So, Jamie, tell us how you got into this industry. Uh, 1978. I was a sophomore in high school. Just got done with my sophomore year. My parents told me you need to get a job. You want you, you want a car? How strange is that? You want a car? Anything you want? You're gonna have to take it, get it yourself. So I got I applied for a bunch of places in Monroe, and sitting waiting for him to call back. My dad had called me on his lunch hour one day. He said, "Hey, you want to work in a cheese factory?" I said, "Okay." Nobody else has called me back yet, so sure. So I. But I had to wait till I got my driver's license, which was in, in July of, of 78. So the day after I got my driver's license, I started here. I got home that day, and my mom had told me, well, one of the other places that, that you applied for called. I said, Mom, I don't know if I can handle this cheese factory work. It's tough stuff. Well, I'll talk to your dad when you get home. Okay, my dad got home. So I told him what the story was. He said, you're staying where you're at. So I took that literally. I've been here ever since. So yeah, um, started here in 78. I worked after school and during the summers. Um, when I graduated high school, Albert Dumpler, the manager at the time, offered me a full-time job. So I took it. Um, that was in 1980. 85, I got my cheese maker's license and continued on from there. Myron Olson took over in 1992. And he started teaching me the finer points of cheese making. With Albert, I learned a good work ethic. Um, Myron, like I said, taught me the finer points of cheese making. In 90, 1989, Myron approached me in, no, no, 99, to be a master cheese maker. I said, I, Myron, I don't know if I know enough about cheese making. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So he kind of pushed me into that a little bit. Not pushed me, I accepted it. But um, And then in 2002, completed the Master Cheese Maker course and got my Master Certification and maybe Swiss and Brick. Now I applied this year again to go through for uh, other cheeses. So I mean, that's where we're at now. Well, you've come a long way from a person who wanted to buy a car to a Master Cheese Maker. <laughs> So something started there, something clicked. Yeah, it was a, a, the challenge of trying to produce something out of milk to where the final product of cheese is what intrigued me. It's like getting from here to here and the gratification of seeing what the good piece of cheese that you've made with your own hands. 
but there's there's passion there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And you know, you mentioned two stalwarts in the industry: Albert Deppler, Myron Olson. Both icons. Yes. Talk about Albert a little bit. It was before our time for some of us. Albert. He was, like I said, he. You, he developed a very good work ethic with him. If you if, if you didn't work and he was on you, but you learned and it, you uh, put in a good day's work. Um, very nice man. If if you were willing to learn, he was willing to teach you, but you had to ha you had to have that work ethic. Myron, like I said, he he wasn't quite as bold as, as Albert was, but he was he he could get you to work on what you wanted to do. And like I said. He, he asked me if I wanted to go into the Master Cheesemaker program. And he helped me along the way, and he, he basically taught me what I know about cheesemaking. That and the Center for Dairy Research yeah. in Madison. So, um, the Center for Dairy Research, how important have they been oh, to you? Oh. you can't, we can't do it without them. The, the folks there are unbelievable, willing to help with every, anything you got questions on. You know, the master program, you learn a great deal with that. And every master cheesemaker will tell you they're, they're still not done learning about cheese. It's, it's, it's continuous. Great. Um, any other mentors that you've had over the years? No, just basically those two. Those two, and yeah. those are those two are the big ones. Yeah, yeah. How yeah, important I, is it to network in the industry? Oh, it's, it's crucial. I mean, you have to be able to, if there's something going wrong with the cheese here, I can talk to another master and say, what do you think about this? And vice versa. That's that's how we work as masters, for sure. All right. And then um, what what's your production like around here? What, what percentage is, you said brick, Limburger, and uh, baby sweets? Brick, we're making about um, 200,000 pounds a year. Um, Limburger is four to 500,000 pounds a year. And our baby Swiss is about three, three and a half million pounds a year. So what you can see is we're, we do mostly baby Swiss. Lindberger's a nice thing to talk about. We're, we're unique with that, but baby Swiss is our business. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you are famous for that. Yeah. We've won a lot of awards with that. Local, national, international levels. Where does the baby Swiss go to? What kind of markets? Well, uh, yeah, mostly delis. They, they will Del buy, buy in a 40-pound block and, and cut it up and slice it for delis, yes. Okay, 40-pound block. Yeah. We do sell some to the military. Um, that's sliced up to one. Yeah. And uh, the type of job that, you know, you, the industry right now is facing a lot of difficulty finding employees. Would you say the cheese industry has a, is a good career for people? It is if they like to work. You got, I mean, there's long hours, um, a lot of overtime. And some of these kids nowadays don't like to do the overtime, but we have a good group of guys here. We, we were struggling for a while until we found some from a temp, temp agency and we, we hire them on full time if we think they're good. But we have, we've been pretty good now for several months. I know there's a lot of them struggling. It's not just a dairy industry that's, that's hurting with that. It's, it's everyone. Right. Right. But yeah, it's a lot of dairy plants are moving toward the automated stages. We've looked into that. It's very, very costly. Like I said, we only have 14 farmers, so they would have to foot the bill for everything. It's kind of hard to do, at this, especially at this point, uh, with the way the milk prices have been for them, and they, they've been hurting a little. Yeah. yeah. The farmers, uh, the 14 farmers, mm -hmm. yeah, every cheesemaker will tell you that it all starts there. It's very crucial. We have very, very good quality farms. We did, the milk quality is exceptional from them, and they keep an eye on it themselves and, and take care of it. They take care of the cows. That's the number one thing. When I start making cheese, that we get, you have to have good milk. And are they, do they take great pride in what you do with the awards and so forth? I hope so. I hope <laughs> so. I I think so. I mean, gets their gets their factory. They own the factory, so it gets their name out there. So. Yeah. You remember how many farmers you had when you first started? We had 52 farms when I started in 1978, and we're getting more milk from 14 farmers than we did now. I think our biggest farm is like 175 cows. The smallest one, 30. But they're all family farms yet. We don't have any big corporation farms at all. 
So. And are, what uh, proximity are they to the plant? They're all within about 15 miles of the plant, so we're very, very close. They so to, they come in and uh, see the work that you're doing and buy some cheese? Oh, yeah. And, yeah they'll come in and they'll come in our store, yeah. Most of the time, the milk haulers will take the cheese right out to them, you know, give them an order, and yeah, they come in. Yeah. Um, tourists. This is a tourist area, uh, Green County. Uh, you get a lot of drivers by to, to the cheese store? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, the cheese store. Um, we don't, per se, give tours anymore. Um, potential big buyers, we will, but um, since 2001, when the, the terrorist attack was, the government kind of put a clamp on right. us to bring people through during production, yeah. which is understandable. but. Um, There'll be some younger couples that come in on the cheese store and want a tour, but we just can't do it. So, um, yeah, and we're on the main drag here, going from Monroe to Madison, and we get we get a lot of people. What's it like making cheese in Green County, in Wisconsin? You got so many comp competitors. How many competitors well, do you think you have? Well, here? we don't. I don't feel the other companies that around here we compete with them at all. Sure. We each got our own little niche. And then we all work together with them. Like I can call anybody up and ask them, "Hey, what do you think about this? How do I manipulate this to make this kind of cheese or whatever?" Um, and they're willing to help that way. We all talk. Everybody gets along very well in Green County, the cheese makers. Yeah. Um, yeah that's. that's I, I heard it tell that the Green County cheese contest. Is the hardest cheese contest to win in the world? Yeah, you're up against some pretty stiff competition around here. Yeah, you've got the Steve Sellers and the Buholzer boys over there, and Chris Raleigh, and and it's, it's Brucey e. Workman. It's it's tough. It's tough. If you can score, if you can get the grand champion at Green County Fair, you know you're something. Yeah, I did that one time years ago, and I've been working at it ever since to get it again. But, yeah. so you're still a young man. And can you envision doing this for another 20 years or so? Oh, I won't be around here in 20 years yet. Oh, you won't? No. Why not? Well, I'm, I'll am i be 77 years old. Okay, okay. Uh, 15 years. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll be here. I'll be here 10, 15 years, yeah. yeah. I'm starting to teach a younger, one of the younger cheesemakers the finer points of thing, like, like I was taught. Um, so the farmers will have somebody to depend on after I'm gone. Yeah, yeah that, that's important. Yes. I was taught that from two icons in the industry, so it's, I feel I'm, it's my responsibility to keep going. And you've never worked anywhere else making no. cheese? <laughs> period. Never worked anybody anywhere else, period. That's you know, well, I shouldn't say that. When I was 12 years old, I was pushing my lawnmower around town mowing, mowing grass for people, so yeah. yeah, this is the only job I've had. Are you interested in innovation and developing new products? Oh, we already have, we're in the process of doing that already, yes. How much fun is that? Oh, I've got a little 1,000 pound vat I mess around with and I can, we're developing some other stuff, yeah. All right. In conjunction with the CDR. Okay. Yeah. Well. Yeah, so yeah, we got some, we got some new products coming down the road. Everybody's excited about it and everybody here. Yeah. yeah. The world doesn't know them yet, but oh, we'll get there with it, yeah. It's got to be fun. It is. It is. It's, it's, it's a ride. I love doing that. I love developing new cheeses and, and that kind of business, yeah. So a lot of that, you know, a lot of the, the new developing cheese is more of a European yes. type flavors and stuff like that. Well, even with the, we've never made cheddar curds before to sell in our store. I started doing that a month or so ago, and it's gone over well. You know, we, so continuing to do that, and there's, like I said, there's some other cheeses that we're coming out with. Um, All right. Well, we'll stay tuned for that. Again, I want to thank Jamie Farney from Chalet, Don Sorn, the producer of this episode. I'm Kevin Tomey. Thank you for watching.